Okay, well, look, we can talk about it, but not actually do that. Yep, yeah. I'm ready to go. I've got both things going. So I've got this live streaming so that people can watch on Facebook, and this is for me to be able to record. So I'll just move around with the camera. Uh, so this is uh, uh, Matt Goodman and Ian Henwood, if you want to give a wave, and Tom in the background, who I'm sorry that we're disturbing again for the second day. Um, and we're going to talk about, the, the, uh, about how the model works from kind of beginning to end and some of the concepts that go with it. Um, Matt and Ian have, or Ian, so Ian built this in the blue t-shirt over there. Ian, give us a wave. Hello, and Matt gives a wave. Hello. Uh, so Ian built this, and Matt, Ian, and I have been working together for over the last couple of days um, to go through the different aspects of the machine. And we presented it last night to a group of people in a room just through there, which went, oh, it's not focused, which went down very well. Um, and now we're going to talk through how the machine works from a basic point of view. Um, so if you guys would like to take over, I will be quiet and just be moving around with the camera. Um, so it'd be great to, uh, great to hear what you have to say. Okay, so um, Ian's... Uh, built the machine, which is this replica of what Hartree and Porter uh, had built back in uh, 1934. And the uh, original had several stages, uh, including, you know, not just two tables that we've got here, but several more. Um, but the principle um, relies uh, uh, around the operation uh, of the table. Yeah. And I kind of need to just run through what the purpose of the machine was to do. And that is to uh, manipulate um, equations uh, of rates of change. And, um, for instance, uh, if you've got a car uh, driving down the street, um, and you, I'll take the same example I used yesterday, that um, a sat-nav uh, tries to tell you what your estimated time of arrival is, how far uh, you're, you're going to take to get there, it actually has to integrate all the different speed changes all together and add up the total mileage to give you how far you're going to go and it adds up all the little amounts of time that it's going to take and come up with those two results. We're going to display one of the results of the machine which is the total distance travelled. So there's an input graph here which shows us the speed that the vehicle is doing down the street, that it uh, say joins some traffic um, it gets stuck in the traffic, the traffic moves out of the way, the guy turns off and the car speeds up. And then he sees some traffic lights uh, in the distance, he takes his foot off the gas, and then he starts braking, and then he comes to a progressive halt. That's what the car's actually doing, and that's the travelling, and this is perhaps the, uh, the speed graph that the speedometer would show. Meanwhile, in your car, you have a, a counter that tells you the number of miles or kilometers, or in this case, uh, hundreds, tens of meters that it has traveled. But here underneath is a graph, which is what the machine is plotting of the total distance traveled. And we know that the integral of uh, a velocity graph is a distance graph mm -hmm. with respect to time. So we've got time on the two horizontal axes, and mm -hmm. these tables will slowly move uh, that way when the machine runs, so it runs from 0 seconds to uh, here uh, 11 seconds. And on the vertical axis, we've got velocity in meters per second, mm -hmm. and the integral of velocity is meters. Yes. We lose the seconds, that's what the integration is. Mm -hmm. And there is a scaled uh, graph on, on the vertical axis. So it's merely taking one graph, doing a little bit of maths, and coming out with another graph. That's a simple first order equation. Mm -hmm. There are two tables here. We can do second order equations, which are obviously power laws. And if you add more tables, you can do more and more complicated uh, uh, solutions to mathematics. That actually can become an incredibly complicated um, set of maths. But in principle, each stage is actually relatively simple. You have a turntable that turns and a wheel that picks up the surface speed of that disc at any chosen point. So that whilst the table is rotating, the pickup point on that table changes. And in fact, we're not going to move the pickup point, we're actually going to move the table relative to the pickup point, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter whether you move one or the other. The table continues turning. When the pickup point is in the middle of the table, there is no net movement. When it's this way, it's anti-clockwise, and when the table, when the pickup point is in the far side of the table, the table's moved here, it's going clockwise. And therefore, you can represent positive and negative uh, values, which are large or small, depending on the speed of both the table and or the wheel. And that movement uh, of the wheel across the table is a controllable um, parameter, 
controlled by the ratios that you pick in the gearboxes at the end here. Mm -hmm. So what, what I'm just going to start asking Ian now is, um, uh, Ian, can you just describe the flow, if you like, of the signal or the data that is coming into the machine, how it goes through the machine, and how it comes back out again, and then we'll look at how and why each bit works as well as it does. Ian, let's start at the beginning. Right. Um, looking at the uh, input and output tables, um, the, they are displaced at a constant rate um, by a motor that is situated just there. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> once you switch it on, the tables start to move. Mm -hmm. Then there is a set of cross wires uh, here. And the idea is that as the table moves and the curve moves underneath, you wind this handle to keep the cross wires always on the curves. And as you can see, as I'm moving the cross wires, it is moving this shaft here, mm -hmm. which goes through and displaces the integrating disc here. Mm -hmm. So when the cross wires are on the zero of the y-axis here, the wheel will be right dead centre. Mm -hmm. As I displace this further and further this way, the disc will move across here and the pickup wheel will start to turn and will get faster and faster and faster as it comes toward the end of this particular wheel. And that is how you input your, your equation. Mm -hmm. Then the pickup wheel goes through this device here, which is a torque amplifier. Mm -hmm. We can explain that in a minute, why yeah, a torque yes. amplifier is needed. Yeah. But the rotational speed yeah. here, it just goes through this bit of mechanism and comes back out here. Then the uh, output then goes through here, along here, and then displaces this pen. Mm -hmm. And don't forget that the table is still moving at a constant rate. So you can then get your uh, output being plotted on this table. And that really is the, 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 simplicity, the simplicity of it. Mm -hmm. That this uh, disc, again, is being driven by the same time drive motor, which is the same motor driving the tables. So this disc is going round at a, at a constant speed. And if you chose to do it, this one could indeed choose to be uh, turning at exactly the same rate and any number of tables. But that doesn't have to be the case. We, we can, uh, Ian can choose ratios so that some part of the mechanism actually drives the table rather than the timing motor. So we can have some relatively complex uh, connections. Uh, the connections are quite simple because you're just merely putting axles and gear ratios between one another. But the equations themselves can be built up to be quite significantly complicated. And that's why in, in rocketry, in um, space exploration, uh, and the move, understanding the movement of the planets, um, uh, population growth, economics, um, the nuclear industry, you need to sometimes solve um, quite horrendous looking equations which actually can't be done by hand. Um, Machines like this uh, were heavily in use in the 1930s, as, as you've written about, Tom, um, right up until the days of digital computers, and even the digital computers. Um, we had a guy last night who came along and he said, look, the way this works in real time is actually faster than some of his highfalutin, quite lovely digital computers that he's got now. Yeah. So he was quite fascinated by the way this worked. And as Ian's pointed out, it's great simplicity. Yeah. Should we just have a little look about how indiv each individual part works? That'd be great. I think it'd be really useful yeah. to explain because it I'm, looks it looks quite complicated from looking through these camera lenses that I'm holding up yeah. right now, and, and I can let's imagine. Let's not have it um, described as something complicated because it yeah. may look that way. But like all good uh, mechanical things, it's quite understandable. It's quite viewable, and we'll start right from the basics. Um, so that if we want to represent a positive number, we choose that a direction of rotation is positive. If we want to represent um, uh, a value of that, then you would rotate uh, something uh, slowly to represent a small number and quickly to represent a large number. And we're all used to that when we're talking about speed. 
Um, we can also give a sign to this, so we can have a large positive number or a large negative number, merely by inputting something into one gear, mm -hmm. and if we want a negative version of it, we can just pick an opposite gear, and when two gears mesh, they are actually going to mesh in opposite directions. So you can actually change the sign um, of your mathematics very, very easily, merely by picking uh, an opposite meshing gear. Mm -hmm. If you look here, the two gears are the same size. Mm -hmm. So you've got a one-to-one -one relationship. If we choose, we might want to actually multiply something by one or two or three or four. If you look just here, the ratio of the number of, uh, the perimeter of this gear compared with that, this is three times bigger than that. So we've got a three to one ratio of speed between this axle and that axle. Mm -hmm. In this instance, we happen to be using the smaller gear, that's the one that's driven, and the larger gear is, sorry, this is the one that's doing the driving, and this is the one that's driven. And so this one will rotate three times slower than the gear there, and that actually can translate, and that's actually driving the table. And we'll talk about why that is later we'll on. We'll talk about the to... reason why yeah. there's a three to one, and in fact, there's, a, there's another one and a half to one involved as yeah. well. But um, just to get, so that you get your idea that um, even though there is uh, multiplication going on, uh, in, in mechanics, multiplication is a very easy thing to do. In fact, uh, Ian and I were discussing before that actually adding two speeds together, you, you need something a little bit cleverer yeah. than a simple meshing pair of gears. So adding is a little bit more complicated, but it's, it's not rocket science. Um, let's just start with um, the translation of, of um, uh, the movement of, of, of uh, either the, the, the pen or, or the pickup. That a screw thread here is used, as you turn the handle, the little brass bar under here is threaded, so as you can see, at quite a slow, as I turn this handle relatively quickly, this little carriage is moving relatively slowly, and that's because there are 32 teeth per inch on this particular bar, and all of the bars happen to be um, threaded at that rate. Mm -hmm. So here we've already got a rotation being translated into a linear movement. Mm -hmm. And that's quite normal for, for, for uh, lead screws. And, and if you're familiar with uh, automatic drives uh, on arms, uh, quite often um, small robots, they don't use pneumatics, they actually use a threaded rod so that as the, the uh, fulcrum turns, the thread um, is rotated into a, some kind of nut and it actually linear, translates circular movement into linear movement. Mm -hmm. We're doing it the other way, we are ensuring that a linear movement stays above uh, the graph here. So we're translating linear movement into rotational movement. And it's then, once we've got rotational movement uh, on this handle here that Ian's shown that it's translated, we're actually then got a rotational figure. So we've got a, a figure of two or three or four. Here it's about three and a half. So when, when the, the um, uh, carriage is here, it represents a value of about three and a half. Mm. But as I turn this, the rate of turning, which is what we're all interested in here, the rate of turning is then what the machine is going to manipulate. Mm -hmm. um, so, as Ian's pointed out, the um, rotational um, information is passed uh, down to the movement of the carriage. So, Ian, how does that happen? Because you, you might just want to point out um, the route that that information is taking to start the yes. movement of the carriage. I'm just yes. going to come around there so I can get a different yep. angle if that's all right. Uh, yeah, so then I can see a little bit more Ian, what you're saying. Yeah, it might be worth doing the grub screw up because then we can move the carriage I'll, I'll when you to, turn the handle. I'm going to have to disconnect it. Oh, because it's, it's in a circle. It's, it's, um, it's with a circular yeah. thing. Yeah. Circular yeah. proving thing. So hopefully, if I do that. So at uh, this moment, I'll just explain that Ian's doing his programming of the, the, the yes. supercomputer here. <laughs> Um, as Ian pointed Could out, you this, 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 is, this is my sonic screwdriver. You, you, you might want to call this um, Visual Basic. Yeah. <laughs> he's using a Visual Basic language, he's losing <laughs> his eyes, and he's got his, his basic programming tool here, so yes. he's got his, his environment. Yes, indeed. <laughs> indeed. So, we have got um, the linear movement here that is now converted into rotational movement. Mm -hmm. And as you can see the gears turning, it goes through this shaft here. Sorry, yeah. That shaft there. It and it could actually do it for both tables, you might it, just want to point yeah. out. It doesn't have to be just one table, it can be any number of it tables. It can be a number of tables. But this carry, that shaft actually carries on, doesn't it? Yes, it does. But in this case, it's actually terminated there at the minute. You then have this right angled drive here. Mm-hmm. 
Try and get in there as best I can there. Through a set of helical gears. Yep. And then it goes through this um, drive here, which changes its uh, rotation of direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then it goes through that shaft at the bottom here onto a piece of threaded rod, again with 32 uh, threads per inch. So is 32 threads per inch, would that, would that be the same standard that Hartshew would have used when yes. you built yes. the original yeah, one? Yeah, okay. did, yeah. And then... So Macaulay's standard screw thread pitch. And then the rotational movement is converted into linear movement again. It's, there's a thread here. That there's a thread, the thread, the fixed there, yeah. thread at the end of this, this carriage. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, I am now displacing that carriage. So Ian's inputting, a, he's giving it a positive number at the moment. Yeah. We're going upwards on the graph, so this uh, is that's positive. That's a negative number. Oh, it's right. A negative a minute, because we were doing another solution. Oh, yes. okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, another right, solution right, to okay, it. Yeah. So really... Um, Oh, because you haven't zeroed it. Yeah, I haven't zeroed oh, it. Okay. So, so now it's zeroed, and now I'm putting in a positive number. Oh, we're into it. We kind of do need to zero. Anyway, yeah, yeah, we need to zero. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. So there again, we're um, converting rotational movement into back into linear movement. Mm -hmm. so, we, so we're actually then we've got to the point where we've um, applying um, a change. Uh, to something, and that is applying a change to this integrator. Now, I suppose now's the right time to talk about the integrator itself. Yes, I thought so, yeah. Yeah. Just pull this wire out and I'll come back around there. Yeah, I'll come around. Because <coughs> I think it's probably easier for me to see this side of it. So, what the integrator's job is to do.